All right, so this morning we continue into the study of the book of Colossians. And uh, just a quick recap, last Sunday we talked about that Paul uh, started the letter with thanksgiving and prayer, uh, showing us how powerful thanksgiving in our lives is. And then it talked about the power of the gospel, how it changes lives. We talked about that changed lives bear fruit. We talked about the power of God gives strength for today. And we also talked about the assurance of an eternal inheritance. And so as we continue in this, I want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles with, open it to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, last Sunday we looked at verses 1 through 14, I think it was. And this Sunday we'll continue from there. And so we, we have the verses on the screen too, and if you don't have your Bibles with, then just look there. And But uh, it, it helps to, at least I know for myself, it helps to just have this passage open in front of me, and I can keep referring to it as I'm listening to somebody speak about a passage. But let's, uh, let's continue into this. So the letter of Colossians was written to this church in Colossae, and it was written somewhere around 60 to 61 A.D., somewhere around there. The Apostle Paul is actually in prison as he writes this letter. And uh, in fact, this letter was written when there was still lots of people alive that would have uh, seen, known Jesus, that would have probably seen Jesus. So uh, this book wasn't written hundreds of years after Jesus uh, died and rose and went back to heaven, but this was written, you know, like 30-ish years after that. And so it's very, very fresh from the time of Christ. And Paul wrote this letter to address some, some false teaching that had come into the church, and especially this idea that Christ wasn't everything. Uh, there were some teachers that had come into the church that were saying, well, you know, Jesus is this and this, but he's not fully God. You know, you, you, there's these other things that you have to consider. And Paul is saying here in this letter, no, Jesus is everything. And so we'll continue to look at that. And, but this morning, I want to, we're, we're going to get into a passage that's, um, that's a little difficult to understand sometimes if we don't understand the Trinity. And I want to just take a couple of minutes and explain the Trinity a little bit. Uh, I, I can't go very in-depth and uh, I'll probably miss a lot of important things, but I'm going to try to explain a little bit how the Trinity of God works, because it can be confusing when we talk about God. It can be confusing, because, okay, so we have, we have God the Father, and we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Spirit, and how does this all fit together? How does this work? How can we have, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet one God? And so I'll try to explain that a little bit, how that works. Um, and, and, and the thing is this, we we believe in, in other things that we can't fully see or understand, right? We believe in things. Like, for example, uh, wind. How many of you have seen wind? You've, you've seen the effects of wind, right? But how many have seen wind? Anybody? Anybody been able to catch a piece of wind and hold it and look at it and, you know, examine it? How does it look? And we can't, right? It's invisible. We cannot. And yet we see the effects of wind. And we know that wind is there, and we know that it's a truth because we see the effects. Uh, but we don't actually see the wind. What about oxygen? How do you know that there's oxygen? It, it looks exactly the same if there's oxygen present or absent, right, in the atmosphere. I mean, we know that yeah, there's oxygen everywhere, but if you could. For example, if you would fill a container with, with a, different, um, a different air, whatever it is, substance, you wouldn't see any difference. If you could actually look into that container, you wouldn't see any difference from oxygen or that, right? You could fill it with, with carbon dioxide or you could fill it with, with, I don't know, argon or you could fill it with whatever li um, air type substance you want. And yet we know that there's oxygen because we're breathing oxygen and we're staying alive and we know there must be oxygen, right? Um, so we, we believe in things that we, d we cannot see. And there's more things. Uh, one of the things that I've always wondered, okay, so how do x-rays work? I know that I can stick my, 
my hand under this machine and it takes a picture and it looks at my bones, but how does that work? How, how does it actually work? So there's a thing called x-rays and we, I don't fully understand it, but it's there and it works and I've seen the results of it. Uh, there's a book written by James White, it's called The Forgotten Trinity. and He says this, when speaking of the Trinity, we need to realize that we're talking about one what, one what, and three who's. The one what is the being or essence of God. The three who's are the Father, Son, and Spirit. We dare not mix up the what's and the who's regarding the Trinity. So there's one God. He's, he's the what. And there's three who's. He's, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And within this definition, there's kind of three fundamental truths. The first one is this, there's only one God. There's only one God. The second one is this, there are three distinct persons. So God the Father is a person, God the Son is a person, and God the Holy Spirit is a person. And the third truth is this, that the persons are co-equal and co-eternal. So one did not come out of the other, they're all co-equal and they're all co-eternal. They're all equal and they're eternal. And he, he observes this, he says, every error and heresy on this doctrine of the Trinity will find its origin in a denial of one or more of these truths. So if you, if you see or hear or read teaching that denies any one of these three aspects, there's a problem. There's a problem with that doctrine. If anybody says, no, there's more than one God, or says that, well, the three persons of the Godhead are not equal or whatever, then beware of that. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, an old book that was written, I think, back in somewhere late 1800s, and this book is called Flatland, A Romance of Many Dimensions. And so this is a book that's written in kind of this old English, and it's uh, interesting to read, but in this book it talks about a, uh, a square that lives in flat land. So it talks of a square, okay? Imagine a square box, but just a, a square with four lines. And it's living in this dimension called flat land. It, it's a land that only has two dimensions. So there's only two dimensions in this land, only two directions. And in, in this, he has this encounter with uh, this uh, character that's called the sphere, the sphere. Do you know what the sphere is? You, you students know. It's a, a 3D object, right? It's like, a, it's like a perfect ball, in other words. And so all of a sudden, it's a 3D object. And so the square, which is a 2D dimension, meets this sphere, and this sphere lives in spaceland. And, and even though this square cannot imagine anything beyond two dimensions, but it believes the sphere when the sphere says, no, there's a land where there's three dimensions. There's a land that has more dimensions than this land. So he accepts the word of the sphere and of the existence of a third dimension. And so uh, as humans, we have, we have this problem comprehending things like the Trinity. There's other things that we have problems comprehending. But we can take it by faith, knowing that the word of God is true. And so we take this by faith, right? There's many things that we take by faith. And this is one of them sometimes that we have to take by faith, even though we don't fully understand how that works, that there can be three people, three persons, and one being, one God. So the article, this uh, particular book, it goes on to say that we cannot understand the concept of a tri triune being any more than the square could fathom the sphere. But we accept the word of God, and by faith we understand that God exists in a realm and in a manner beyond our experience. See, he exists somewhere we, we don't have any experience. We, we can't go there. One day we plan to go there, right? But here on this earth, we don't have the comprehension of how God works and in fullness and how it all looks. 
We cannot completely understand God's existence. An infinite God cannot be fully delineated in a finite illustration. So with the understanding that we as humans have, we cannot fully comprehend God's greatness. But we can see a lot of it. So here, I'll show you a few pictures. So I'm, I'm, uh, I grew up in the manufacturing industry, so this is how I understand some things. So let's put the first picture up. So you have a drawing here, and you have a, a view of this particular part, okay? So you see this part. And you see, well, there's a couple of holes and there's a couple of lines, but from this picture, you, you don't see the full part yet. I mean, those of us that work with drawings, we can already start imagining, oh, it probably looks like this. Norman here is already busy figuring out what this part looks like. But if, y if you're totally, you don't know what drawings look like, you kind of, well, okay, there's a few lines there, but whatever. And then the next picture, all right, now all of a sudden we see an other perspective of this part and now suddenly we get we get more of a picture right and we see oh okay well that's a little more detail I can understand a little better how this thing looks but you still don't fully know for sure and the next picture gives you another view so now you see okay well there's you know that arc and there's that angle and the, all this and so now you can kind of start to put it together what it should look like, but then when you see the full 3D view, now you see the full picture of what that part looks like. A and you see this, that, you know, the two holes cannot take the place of the one hole on the side. Like, it wouldn't work. It they don't do the same job. Or the groove, the slot there, it doesn't do the work of the hole. And yet it's all part of the same piece. Let's, let's look at the, the triune God a little bit like that. They all have their distinct God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They all have their distinct work that they do in the Godhead. But yet they're all part of the same, the same Godhead. Now this is very, very, it, it does no justice to explaining God. But hopefully the concept, hopefully it does, helps a little bit with understanding the concept. Uh, there's another picture there. I'll put that one up. This gives you a little bit of an idea. There's God in the middle. Uh, God is Son. God is Father. God is Spirit. But yet, Spirit is not Son. Son is not Spirit. Spirit is not Father. Father's not. So, they cannot replace each other. They all have their work that they do in the Godhead. And yet, they are the same God. So, hopefully, that gives us a little bit of an of a intro into trinity into the triune god so we we're going to talk about colossians 1 15 to 29 today and this passage of scripture it basically talks about the supremacy and the sufficiency of christ it talks about the fact that jesus christ is supreme he is over everything and yet it talks about also that jesus christ is sufficient for our redemption. He is totally sufficient. There's nothing lacking. Jesus is all that we need to become right before God. He is all that we need to become right before God. And so we'll see four things about Christ. And so this Sunday, I'm going to take this passage and I'll break it into four parts and we'll look at each part individually. And the first one is this, as we've already talked about the Trinity, I'm going to talk about that Christ is part of the triune God. So Colossians 1, 15 to 17, let's read this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. So we see here that Christ is the firstborn of creation. And so Christ is not a created being. He is the firstborn. He is the first that there was of the visible image of the invisible God. 
He is not created, but he's preeminent sovereign. The part of God that became visible to mankind, if we want to put it that way. And it's amazing how, how intertwined creation is with Jesus. It says here very clearly that, that Jesus, that through him, God created everything. Through him. Jesus was right there. So, so all of a sudden, to me, this picture of why Jesus was willing to come and die for us becomes a lot clearer. Because he was personally involved with creating mankind in the first place. He, he loved them right from the start. He was involved in putting us together. Through him, everything was created. And not just, not just things we can see, but even the things that we cannot see. And it says, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. See, even the, the aspect of authority was created through Jesus. See, there's no, according to this, there's no authority that wasn't created by Christ. He created it. And he holds all things together. Jesus holds all things together. Ha have you ever thought about uh, why things stick together? I mean, maybe you don't think such useless thoughts as I do, but I sometimes wonder why do things stick together? Like, uh, if our human body is how much percent water, do they say? Like 90-something? 80? 80? It's like a high percent of, of water. Like, that's our body. Why don't we just flop, you know, just like sink, like, like a balloon, like a water balloon? I mean, why does I don't know. I mean, we have some bones, I guess, that kind of keep us somewhat in the right position, mostly. But yet, it's an amazing thing to think about. How, how does that all hold together? How does that all hold together? Christ is what holds creation together. Even things like the laws of nature are subject to him. He is fully involved and aware of all the laws of nature. Why, why, does the, uh, why do the planets stay spinning around the earth or in the, around their orbits or... Why is there gravity? Like, why if I would drop my phone down there, would it actually fall? Why wouldn't it rise? I mean, all these things. Jesus is fully involved in all of this. He's fully involved in, in creating enough cold on this earth to make us wait for summer, and then enough heat in summer to make us wait for winter again. And, and he knows exactly where those temperatures are. He's got the thermostat right in his hand, right in his control. And sometimes we think he's making a mistake, but he isn't. He understands. He knows why, and he holds this all together. So the human body, like I said, has a big percent water. Actually, I think it's 31%, but I'm not certain. I need some scientists here to tell me for sure. Here, here's a few more things about the human body. Your body produces enough energy in one day to drive a truck 20 miles. That's quite a bit of energy. That's how much energy our bodies create daily. Our heart creates that. It, our DNA, DNA, so we have DNA in our bodies that, that say what we are, right? That's kind of like the recipe of who we are. It's the instructions that make us who we are. This is beyond me, my level of understanding, but this is what the scientists say. And they say this, that if you could unravel your DNA, all the DNA in your cells, in your body, you would have a line of instructions 10 billion miles long. That's a lot of instruction to say who you are, to define who you are as a person. And another interesting thing I came across is that with one step, your body uses up to 200 muscles with one step. I didn't even know I had that many muscles. I thought most of my muscles were kind of gone. <laughs> but I have at least 200 according to this. And Christ was involved in all of this. So not just God that created God the Father, but God the, the Son and God the Holy Spirit. They were all fully involved 
into creation. That's amazing. The second thing is this. Christ is the head of the church. So we have this, this Christ that was so involved in, in our existence and in our creation. And he is the head of the church. Isn't that amazing? The same Christ is now the head of the church. Let's go on to verses 18 to 20. It says, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who are raised from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So not only is he holding all of creation together, but he is head of the church, his body. Jesus is the life source and the leader of the church. He is the one that gives life, and he is the one that leads. He is the first to rise from the dead, and so he is never, he will never die again, right? And so as believers die and rise from the dead, Jesus is the first. He was the first to do it. He is over that as well. And the church is his body on earth doing his work that he is ahead of. And, and so this is a powerful thing, and we could have a whole message on this, and I won't, I won't go into that more in detail today, but here's the thing, that as the church of Jesus Christ, when we take him out of the headship, when, when, when our priorities become bigger than his leadership of the church, then we have a problem. When, when, when it's us building something, instead of looking at Christ and saying, what do you want to do? Then we have a problem, right? When it, is, when it becomes our mission rather than his mission, we have a problem, right? If he is truly the head of the church, then we have no option but to look at him for instruction, right? And we would want to. I mean, there's no leader on earth that is better at leading anything than Jesus Christ is. And so the mission that he gives us as a church, I think, is very, very simple. It can look many different ways. It can have many different forms. But basically, the mission that he gives us is to reconcile people back to God, is to reconcile people back to the Father. This is the mission. This is really in a nutshell. If, if our mission is to build a building, if that is the goal, is just how big of a building can we make and how big of a service can we have and how this and that, if that is the essence of our goal, then we're missing it. If the essence is that we want to reconcile people to God through this. Now we have a mission that we can believe in. And now we have a mission that we can be empowered in. So he is the head of the church. Uh, third thing is this. Christ is the righteousness of the believer. So let's go to Colossians 23, chapter 1, verse 23, 21 to 23. And it says, This includes you who are once far away from God, Okay, I'll back up to verse 20. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So he made peace with everything. And then it says, this includes you who are once far away from God. So we're included in this thing that Christ made peace with. It says further, you were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news was preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. This is amazing. Jesus became the righteousness for us. In his, his own body, he is, it says he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless 
as you stand before him without a single fault. Wow, once, once we were separated by sin, right? But now we can be, we are justified through Christ and we are completely accepted by God the Father. We are now reconciled back to God. And the amazing thing is that we can stand before God holy and blameless. That's amazing. I mean, if you're like me, you make enough mistakes to feel unholy and justify some blame in your life, right? And yet, Jesus says, you can stand before God holy and blameless. That is powerful, powerful. There's an illustration that Donald Barnhouse used that said, if we look through a piece of red glass, everything is red. Through a blue glass, everything is blue. Through yellow glass, everything is yellow, and so on. The glorious truth is that when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, God looks at us through the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees us in all the white holiness of His Son. This is the great New Testament doctrine of imputation of our sin to the account of Christ and His righteousness to our account. There's a transaction that happens. And Jesus takes on our unrighteousness and we receive his righteousness. So when God looks at us, when God the Father looks at us, he sees us through his Son. And any time he looks at, at you as a believer, he sees Jesus Christ in front of you. And he sees that righteousness because Jesus died for you. He died for those sins. He died for those shortcomings. He died for those issues that we have. And Paul says, you know what, uh, now you need to continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. And so we need to continue walking our, out our salvation, right? We need to continue to pursue our relationship with Christ. We don't want to drift away from this assurance. And we drift away from this assurance when we start to allow other things to come between us and God. When we don't keep Jesus there, we're starting to drift away from that, right? But it's such a powerful picture. If you feel like either you feel like giving up or you feel like, well, you are, you're, you, you're just not worth anything or, you know, you just don't have it together. You know what? God isn't looking at that. He's looking at Jesus who you've received as his Savior. And he's looking at that righteousness. And he says, wow. My son is holy and righteous before me. My daughter is holy and righteous before me. That's powerful. Fourth thing that we see in this scripture is this, in this chapter. Christ is the believer's assurance and power. So we'll, we'll end with verses 24 to, to 29. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the, righteous, that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Here's the secret. Christ lives in you. That's the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. This secret that he's talking about is a secret that people long to understand before Jesus came. For thousands of years, they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking to understand the secret of how God would reconcile people back to himself. And all of a sudden, Jesus came. And, and the secret is now revealed to us. And it's not just to the Jewish people who were God's special chosen people, but now it's open to every, every person, right? Every one of us. How many of us are Jews? Not too many, I think, if any. We don't have Jewish heritage. 
probably all of us don't have. Maybe we have a little bit at some point. I don't know. But the truth is, if God hadn't decided that he would apply this to the Gentiles as well, we would, have, we, we would be in foolishness today. We wouldn't be here. We would have no, no Savior. We would have no redemption back to the Father. But Jesus didn't just die for the Jewish people. He also died for us. And so the Apostle Paul says that he is glad to suffer for Christ for participating in this work of the gospel. You know, sometimes we can, I want to uh, close here, so the worship team, if you want to come up, go ahead. But um, sometimes we feel like, well, you know what, I shouldn't have to suffer. I'm a Christian, right? Jesus loves me, you know, he died for me, and I'm his child. Why am I suffering? Why am I going through these hard times or or why do I have opposition in my life? Or why is it a battle? Or all this, right? And yet Paul says that he is glad to suffer for Christ. Because he sees that what Jesus did for him is such a powerful thing. Nothing can come against him that Jesus hasn't already won victory over. And then all of a sudden his circumstances aren't controlling him. Rather, it's the love of Jesus that's controlling him. And Paul ends with the encouragement to stay true in our relationship with Christ. And just as he is depending on the mighty power of Christ in, sin, in him, so we need to also do, right? So Christ is Lord over all. He is the all-sustaining Lord who has every part of creation in his control. And he is the all-sufficient Lord who has filled every requirement for us to be seen as righteous before the Father. This is the whole essence of this passage of Scripture. And, and the question is, how, how does that apply to me and you today? What difference does that make to us today? I, I would ask this question. Do you have the peace of God ruling your heart? Do you have his peace and his love working in your life? Is that controlling you? Is that running your life? Do you rest in his promises that he is always with you and for you? Does it motivate you to share Christ to others? What does it do in your, your life, right? So let's be the body of Jesus and let's let him be the head that he wants to be that he is rightfully the head of the church and let's continue to pursue the mission that he gives us right as a church and as believers 